Try to be quiet in every way. The body is sitting here still. Breathing is quiet. And as for the chatter in the mind, don't get involved. There are two ways of dealing with it. One is to block it out, say with a meditation word like butto. You can just think butto, butto, butto very fast. It's like jamming the circuits. Or try to immerse yourself in the breath as much as possible. The chatter may be in the background, but you don't have to pay any attention to it. Don't give, any, give it any importance. And you find that as you don't feed it, it grows weaker and weaker, and the mind really does get more and more quiet. Because it's only when the mind gets quiet that you can begin to notice things. I remember one time when I was in a Back in Ryong, a group of people came from Bangkok came up, came up the hill where I was staying. It was in the old ordination hall there, an old concrete block building. And they came up and they exclaimed at how peaceful and how quiet it was there in the monastery. And then they sat down and they turned on their boombox. All the better to hear the peace and quiet with. And that's the way a lot of us are when we sit and meditate. The body's still, the breath is still, but the mind is like a boombox with all kinds of thoughts and concerns. And for many of us, meditation is the only time of the day when we really get to sit and be with our thoughts without any interruption. But that's not what it's for. We're here to watch, to observe. And so we have to do what we can to discourage the mind's involvement with all that inside chatter. The Buddha breaks it down to two types of activities. One is directed thought, and the other is evaluation. You direct your thoughts to a topic, and then you start mulling it over. Commenting on this, commenting on that, book, backing up a little bit, restating things. Sometimes it's almost like there's several voices in your head taking on different roles. Evaluating things from one perspective or another. And what you want to do is turn your directed thought to the breath and evaluate the breath. So you're using the mind's verbal abilities, its verbal tendencies, but you're trying to direct them to a better purpose, a quieter purpose. Because when you direct it to the breath, there's what, what is there? There's not that much. Just simply notice when it's coming in, notice when it's going out. Notice when you're forcing it out too much, there's a kind of a squeeze, <coughs> a squeeze that comes at the end of the breath. Or if there's a catch in the breath when you're, when you're trying to pull it in. Notice how you relate to the breath energy. Which parts of the in-breath you like and don't like, which parts of the out-breath you like and don't like, don't like. It's amazing that you can have all kinds of opinions even about this. But at the very least, as you get more interested in the breath, that helps other things quiet down. Because you're not feeding them. If you pay attention to those thoughts, those, all that vagrant chatter in the mind, of course it's going to keep on going. Sometimes even paying attention to it to the extent of telling yourself you want it to stop, that encourages it. So you have to try another approach, which is Direct your verbal tendencies to the breath. Think up questions about the breath. That's how you direct your thought to things. What's this? What's going on in here? Is it as good as it could be? Do your best to get interested in the breath. Then to evaluate it, you've just got to watch it. The more still the mind is otherwise, the more you can see. John Lee breaks the breath energy in the body down to three levels. First there's the in and out breath, and then there's the waves of breath energy that go through the body as you breathe in, as you breathe out, that go along the nerves, that go along the blood vessels. And then finally he says there's a still breath. And 
which you can locate in those resting spots of the breath that he mentions in Method 2. The tip of the nose, the palate, base of the throat, the tip of the sternum, a point just above the navel. If you can get really quiet, you can sense that there is this stillness there at these points that you can access. And there's a way of focusing in on it that it seems to spread throughout the whole body, radiating, radiating from those points. Now the only way you can notice these very subtle breath sensations is to make the mind as quiet as possible. Just watch, like a hunter. The hunter has to be very still so as not to scare the animals away. But at the same time, he has to be very alert so that he notices when they come. We can make a comparison with the mind state we try to develop. If we're listening to something far away, we want to hear it very clearly. We just get everything as quiet inside as possible so we can pick up the subtle, the subtle sounds that are coming our way. The only way you can really see the subtleties of the mind and the body are to get the mind as quiet as possible with its thought directed. In other words, its attention is directed to a particular thing, in this case the breath. If you just make things quiet without having any real object, the mind begins to drift and has a very strong tendency to want to go to sleep or just to blur, blur out, blank out which doesn't accomplish anything at all. There has to be a focus. So again, it's that focus of a, a hunter. Anthropologists say that when they try to pick up the skills of primitive tribes, this is the hardest one of all, the skills of a hunter, because it requires so much mental discipline. So we're here hunting the deathless. In the beginning, we're hunting subtle breaths, and then we're hunting still breaths, and then we're hunting the state of the mind, and then the very subtle movements in the mind. It requires successive levels of getting more and more and more still. So if you sense anything that's disturbing the stillness, just let it go. Don't get involved. Don't let it entangle you. Direct your thought to being as sensitive as possible to the breath. Then to the point you find where you're with the breath so much, you're so immersed in the breath that you don't even have to direct your thought to it anymore. It's almost like your awareness and the breath are one. And then you just maintain that focus. That allows the mind to be even more still, even that subtle level of inner, ch inner chatter that goes along with the Directing a thought to the breath and evaluating that can be dropped as well. In fact, you find that a lot of the progress in concentration practice comes from noticing even more subtle levels of chatter and letting them go. Then running across an even more subtle level, you keep peeling away. Finding all kinds of crazy things being said in the mind, but you let them go until it's just the chatter that keeps the mind on its topic, whether it's the stillness of the breath or a sense of space or a sense of knowing. There's going to be that label. It's called, they're called perception attainments. At this point, it's not called direct thought and evaluation. It's simply perception, the label you put on things, which hardly qualifies as verbal sankaras. Verbal sankaras are sentences. These are just simple words. But still, there is that level of disturbance. Stay with that particular level as long as it keeps you focused. And learn how to let it go when it becomes an obstacle to seeing things that are even more subtle. You can take this basic principle because it embodies a lot of the different teachings, the teachings on the Four Noble Truths. Look for where there's stress, in this case the disturbance, and then see what you're doing to maintain it. Let it go. Or the teachings on emptiness. Notice what your mind is empty of. Notice what's still there, what disturbance is still there, and see if you can let the disturbance go without destroying your 
state of concentration. As the Buddha said, there is no happiness aside from peace. There is no knowledge aside from what can be seen with a still mind. Everything else is guesswork.